Hello. So, uh, today's lecture is on progressive cognitive training for movement performance. I would actually probably call it more of this uh, introduction, laying some groundwork, a little bit about, you know, where we are and, and um, as, as a profession and, and also some of my, uh, my experience that in, in just a minute. So a little bit of an introduction, we'll cover some definitions, a little bit of background as to, you know, what this is, the concepts, some of the information uh, that we have, look a little bit about into the implementation, including, you know, some of the things that I've been doing, um, and then really just a basic uh, discussion and conclusion um, in terms of sort of where we are, where we may be, and, and whether or not it's something that you may uh, as implementation goes. Um, so a little bit of introduction. So, um, so my name is uh, is Chris Prue. Um, education. My background is in is in exercise science, and I'm also a, a licensed chiropractor and a uh, certified athletic trainer. So I did my bachelor's and master's in in exercise science and um, near PhD. Uh, in exercise science, performance-based outcome measures uh, predominantly, and then a doctorate of chiropractic in, um, in chiropractic. My experience, you know, really is in, it, it teeters, you know, a lot of people say, well, it seems like you have such a diverse background, and I think there's actually a lot of, a lot of overlap in it, you know, so I started out really my career in, in fitness and, and personal training, uh, at the same time, while being an exercise specialist or exercise physiologist in a sports medicine clinic working with physical therapists. Um, and then went on to graduate school and, and worked with uh, a great program, great uh, people at Appalachian State University with uh, Dr. Mike Stone and uh, Meg Ritchie Stone and, and um, certainly my, uh, my fellow graduate students equally. Um, as important and many of which I still stay in contact with today. So I've been a performance coach and a strength coach along with being a, a clinician um, in training people and, and treating people for, for conditions, but also in the, in the general population. And I would say, you know, in, in working with various athletes over the, over the course of my, I guess now 25 year professional career at this moment, um, working a lot in the in the youth developmental programs and in developing youth athletes and sort of figuring out ways that you know we can sort of best integrate that and then alongside that with the clinical perspective sort of moving away more so from the sports medicine but more geared towards you know general health and and part of you know this lecture and where we're going with it is based on you know some of the changes that we've experienced over uh, the years in terms of how we're training people what's available to us as far as technology goes and and maybe some of the different approaches that we're taking today that uh, we didn't have available to us years ago partly due to you know testing and figuring out um, where some of those deficits may lie and how we can figure out uh, the best way to approach those deficits, but also to, um, to know what's working, right? And so not only figuring out where we're lacking, but you know, is whatever it is that we're doing, is it, uh, is it performance enhancing in, in whatever aspect? And of course, along with that, environments and changes in, um, other types of, of situations that are influencing not only how we train, but you know how people are developing through the course of their life, and and even you know on the what might some some consider the the backside of of life, you know when we're not at those those younger stages. So I want to cover some some operational definitions, and really the first one is is cognition, and I don't think that's a new concept to. Uh, um, to anyone, but you know, sort of the the why, you know, what is what is cognition? How is it really connected? And and really for me, it's been fascinating to um, to develop my concepts and, and where it fits not only in training but in uh, treating patients and you know where it fits within within the healthcare realm. Um, and 
is it worthy? You know, should we be spending much time on it? Does it just automatically have things that, uh, that we're already, already delving in? Should it just be focused on, you know, the older adults? You know, we always get the, the implication that, that young people will develop automatically. And to some extent, you know, that's very, very true. Um, but is there anything that we can do to enhance that? And then the other, you know, component to that is we don't want to do anything to have a negative influence on uh, a young person's growth and development. Uh, the evidence, you know, where where is the evidence? I think there's a lot of evidence in, in cognition in general, but where is it in terms of how we're approaching and, and treating people and training people within that within that overlap? I think the evidence is, is going to be, uh, as I'll show you some of it, is much stronger in, you know, okay, we know what physical activity may do to cognition, um, but how can cognition training influence the motor developmental uh, piece? And then the cost benefit ratio. At the end of the day, if you are training people and you have one hour three times a week, um, or maybe you're, you're a, um, an actual uh, performance coach, that's, uh, that's your full-time job working with the same, the same groups of people, and you may get them four or five times a week, depending on your situation, even then, you know, it's probably unlikely that you have, you know, two to three hours available to you. So we need to figure out, you know, where everything kind of fits in, uh, where we get the most bang for our buck. And, you know, kind of like, as we've seen changes in, in family life and school systems, you know, ethics, morals, and values, you know, maybe not being taught as much at home and more stress being on the, uh, the academic institutions to kind of pick up that load. You know, similarly, where are we finding it in terms of sport performance, but also just human performance and in, in more people might actually be seeing um, a performance coach instead of, you know, the quote unquote, uh, clinically licensed person just because of the shift in healthcare, the responsibility, and frankly, overall, uh, the dramatic changes in the influence in consumerism with regards to healthcare. Uh, because of changes in, in healthcare and reimbursement, even, you know, something, it's simple but expensive in terms of that shift in the, re, the financial responsibility is to well, if I'm paying, you know, $40 copay, am I going to go as, as often as I used to? So like when I first started out in, in clinic, I mean, a lot of patients, we didn't, they didn't have copays and there were no restrictions. We saw patients basically as many times as we needed to, as long as we wanted to versus today. A lot of that is very much delineated in terms of, um, uh, the number of visits that, that we can clinically see a patient and, um, as, as well as, you know, some of the things that we can even do to the people. And that, I shouldn't say that that's, you know, completely delineated. I should say that those restrictions are more based on who's going to pay for it, who's willing to pay for it, than what are we actually allowed to do. I mean, um, there's more of that limitation. My, uh, my daughter's water bottle, she allows me to use it. So some definitions and again probably nothing that that is going to be new or or groundbreaking but just to make sure we're on the on the same page because some of these things you know have kind of changed at least in within my career um sensory input versus motor response you know the sensory input is you know all the different senses that we have you know from visual audible uh, from tasting um to um, the sensory input that we get, you know, even as a result of, of, uh, of breathing and uh, mechanoreceptors and all of those sorts of things that give information to our system, either directly through the nervous system, partly due, you know, to the endocrine system and go back up into our brain and, and tell it to process it and, and make a decision. And even some of that doesn't even make it all the way up to the brain. The body may make a decision uh, prior to that. So then we, we typically, at least with regards to, you know, sport performance and motor performance in general, even in, in health, you know, such as, you know, falling over in, in older adult population, making sure that, uh, that we can recover before we, we become injured. So that motor response from a voluntary standpoint is we, we have control over it. So also referred to as a, as a reaction, right? A voluntary reaction, I should say, versus involuntary reactions or involuntary reflexes are things that 
happen automatically. So we, we don't have to have to think of those things. I think some people get those two things confused. I seem to be doing this a lot, a lot of hand work. Um, those two things confused because, you know, we want cat like reflexes in reaction, right? And so in sport, we want something as a reaction, a voluntary, you know, change in direction to be very much like a reflex. Because the longer we think about something, um, the more time that something else can take place, right? I can be tackled, I can I can miss a ball if I'm if I'm trying to distract it or you know whatever whatever the case may be. Um, so the 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 reflex is something that is embedded in our neurological system, right? And so it's a response that is stimulated by um, some of those receptors, the sensory inputs, and then the body act automatically uh, does something, right? So the deep tendon reflex, a blink reflex, something that we don't have to think about. And those are important because a lot of times they're, they're also going to keep us from getting ourselves into, into danger, right? And so this deep tendon reflex is there, we take a reflex hammer and we strike the tendon, the patella tendon or patella ligament, and it quickly results in a stretch, which then provides some sensory input. It stretches, you know, those muscle spindles and says, hey, you know, stretching too rapidly. And I didn't know about that. So we should probably make a, a change to that dynamic. And in that case, that sensory input makes its way to the spinal cord. The spinal cord says, Whoop, let's make muscle contraction instead of allowing it to lengthen too rapidly. Um, not under our control, let's make it shorten, right? So then we go back to and we create a muscle contraction. So in that sense, you know, that that deep tendon reflex or or stretch reflexes, as some people refer to it, is um, a response, you know, sort of in a, in a guarding activity. So we have different ways that we respond to, you know, a stimulus and it can be visual, it can be audible, and it can be touch or, or pressure through, um, using mechanoreceptors. It's, it's not instantaneous, obviously, it has to travel. Even though it's a, a relatively short pathway, it still takes time to get from point A to point B and then back to point A again, if you wanna call that point C, which is going to be a, a little bit different. So the average reaction, or a better term would be response, for a visual stimulus is, you know, 20 or excuse me, 200 to 250 milliseconds. So about a quarter of a, of a second. Again, it doesn't seem like a, a whole lot of time, but, you know, in certain events, a lot can happen within that time. So if you if you're, you know, involved in high performance training and you look at literature, for example, on going from uh, basically at rest to uh, maximal force production, in a particular event like a uh, isometric mid thigh pull um, within a quarter of a second a lot has happened and so that can be the difference between either getting someplace or like i said potentially hitting a ball or not hitting a ball um, and then audible is even shorter and then potentially touch and pressure is even shorter which is good because if i touch you know something like a hot stove i don't want to be on that too long because that would actually be a, a problem and, and potential uh, result in uh, in injury. So we use we use this and we know this information. So this is pretty standard. And historically, we've said, well, we we can't um, we can't train that right because it is it's monosynaptic. It doesn't go up to the brain or you know doesn't go up to the cortex and for your brain to think about and make a reaction. Right, it goes to the spinal cord whoop, and then comes back. So there's no thought process, right? It's kind of like a shark. A shark really is basically a notochord, a spinal cord without a brain. They don't think, they really just respond and react from a, almost a reflex-like standpoint. And that's why if you've ever watched sprinting, um, they have sensors in, in the blocks, at least at, at high events. And uh, we know that if between when the gun goes off and when someone you know pushes and, and generates enough force to get out of the blocks, and it's less than, I forget the exact number, but let's say if it's less than um, 150 milliseconds, we know that they were jumping the gun because the human, uh, it's not that capable, right? And so um, 
we, we use that to our, our advantage in, in making sure that, you know, people are on the same playing field. A big one is going to be agility, right? So agility is really important because we think of that as a major component of sports performance in probably all sports, you know, anything that, that at least you have to change direction um, and, and it doesn't have to be against another player or, or even an implement. You know, it could be moving your own your own body through space, and it and it and it may have, you know, some slow components, some rapid components, things that involve a thought process. When you look at the, the three biggies, there's cognitive, physical, and and uh, and technical. So that's why I'm I'm kind of bringing us. Oops, let me let me start over here. I'm bringing us over towards you know that cognitive piece because a lot of us spend a lot of time on the physical and the technical aspect of things. Right. And so we get bigger, we get stronger, we practice our swings, those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, do we have we had a good handle on on how to train, you know, that uh, that cognitive piece? And so, you know, think about agility, for example, and the uh, classic example is an agility ladder. Right. So we use an agility ladder to train agility. But are we really training agility, you know, how much thought process is going on in something that is, you know, completely predictable, albeit that's very impressive when someone can move that fast and, and have that amount of control over it. And that is certainly part of agility, because remember, look at the look at the three components, which include technical and, and physical, and why, you know, the physical component is really important, because that dude needs to create a whole lot of ground reaction forces. I am equally impressed with the gentleman in the far back because he's dancing. He's got rhythm, and believe it or not, that actually takes a whole lot of skill. Um, and why, you know, historically we've seen, you know, football players taking ballet lessons and really had more to do with, you know, moving their their body through uh, through spaces. So watch watch number thirty two here. Um, and so now we're kind of taking someone's ability to certainly move their feet about as quickly as possible, but now they have an unpredictable environment. So they don't know exactly which direction they're trying to predict within best reason, you know, which direction is that person possibly going to move, you know, what's going to be the best direction for me to move in. Um, so some of that also has to do with, you know, what kind of available uh, force production do I have or how much distance do I have to make up, you know, any speed or how much time will it take to make a to make a transition. So a lot of that is cognitive in, in learning, you know, your body. And, and we think some of it, you know, is intelligence and, and that kind of that is, is in there. But. Think of it more as, you know, movement intelligence or body intelligence and knowing your body, knowing the game, um, but, you know, make the make the right decision. Right. Uh, balance. Right. So balance is important because we have a lot of perturbations, you know, whether on the court, on the field and so on and so forth. And so our, our best dictation of how to overcome that is being able to respond you know, as quickly as possible. So one of those is to make sure that you don't put yourself into a situation that's detrimental to begin with, right? So you want to keep yourself from having to go off of balance, off of an unstable environment, right? And so that's probably the most key factor is the is the stability piece. And understanding, you know, and being a, a smarty when it comes to human movement is really important because now you're taking all of that information in which, in, you know, includes, you know, three different com components, vestibular system, visual system, and somatosensory, right? All those um, afferent, the in sensory information going in, your visual system, maintaining a level horizon. I love using, you know, sprinting as, as a perfect example because, you know, when we do th something from a static position versus a, a dynamic position, and if you watch Usain Bolt's torso throughout this, you don't see a whole lot of, of displacement going on. And in fact, you know, if we just looked at his torso, you would almost think you you just see his mouth moving a, a, a little bit, even though he's in a very, very dynamic environment. And that takes a lot of a lot of concentration, you know, mind concentration, because that dude is generating a lot of ground reaction forces and he has to compensate for that. So every time they pound down, um, they need to compensate from that and not, you know, kilter from from side to side not only would that be a waste of energy 
but it was on the overall performance and probably integrating and i've done a lecture on, on this a few times in the past too is looking at brain speed or what's referred to as neural integration right so when it comes to reactions not a reflex but a reaction in other words information came into my my body it went up to my brain you know and it said hey what are we going to do about this and then making a decision right so like number 32 on that field you know should i go right or should i go left you don't have a lot of time to think about that right and within that there's a whole lot of other things going on such as you know how much available force production power production do i have you know what's the distance between this person and that person when are they going to reach that will i get there first and so on and so forth and all of that all of those things need to take place over a very very short period of uh of time and so brain speed is that neural integration it's taking the information in from the the sensory inputs and it's the decision making process right and so think about what we're trying to accomplish things like cognition and how we we try and and train that system right because if i can get better at making decisions right decisions right so it's not just about making a decision which direction to go in but it's also making the right decision and it's looking at you know that uh, that predictability and some of you are probably involved in this or have interest in it and you know i have a particular interest in in some tactical stuff especially when it comes to comes to shooting but you know in training those people um the wrong decision is not just you know loss of a down you know not hitting a ball i mean it, it could be someone's life and so so there's a lot of uh, you know on the line there and why it's really important that not only do you make a decision quickly but it it needs to be the uh needs to be the right decision um and and i i love this quote by warren buffett no matter how great the talent or efforts some things just take time you can't produce a baby in one month by getting uh, nine women pregnant obviously because it takes nine months to uh, um, to develop a, um, a baby right and so uh, when we look at the background and, and same thing you know and working with a lot of youth athletes and either parents or athletes and and the, the coaches themselves and in that you know we joke you know Rome wasn't created in a day and and uh, and neither was an Olympian. And if you talk to you know true Olympians, and after one Olympics is over, they've got a four-year plan. You know when they when they look at the next one, and and that you know overall training is is very it's component, it's compartmental. And so you know although there there's no tr there's no you know substitute for experience, but you know a football player doesn't just become a better football player just because they play football, right? um or you know i love this this uh this movement towards you know things like strongman competition for example um in in using that as a training methodology and i you know we we do some of that too but keep in mind that that, that would kind of be like you know if that was the only thing you did you need to make sure that you're getting your appropriate transferability and i like to remind people that these athletes you know like pujanowski was doesn't look like that because all he did was lift stones right <laughs> because he did a whole lot of other things you know to supplement the sport you know with uh, with the overall training so you know looking at motor development and and you know even from from my own experience and perspective and i did a lecture new england regionals you know in in i think it was 2013 to 2014 because i remember i'll show you a video here of of, uh, of my daughter in that and looking at even you know how my like i said i work with with a lot of youth in how you know the implications with regards to cognition have influenced you know my overall training so when we look at this uh what affects motor development you know it's it's multi-dimensional and why you know it really is important to take all of these things into consideration and where we can kind of capitalize and, and things that we we have available to us to uh, uh to change age is uh is not one of them but you look and there's there's cognitive be a uh, a certain component so you know i want to tie in well where does where does cognition fit and i guess you know we'll look at it from the reverse perspective and well 
Well, what happens when you don't move and what happens when movement, how does movement influence, you know, cognition, you know, being involved in health and fitness and actually, you know, coming from my lineage and my degree program was in a, a physical education department. So, you know, we're big on, on youth development and physical education. And actually that, you know, that's the lineage of exercise science in general is <clears throat> that overall developmental developmental process and, and why, you know, we we always fought for and argued, you know, don't take physical education out of your program because people are scoring poorly on tests. Maybe it actually is linked to the lack of physical activity. We find that, you know, when people are more active, um, they don't have to study as much. Uh, they do tend to score better on, on overall tests. Uh, in, in, in another lecture, you know, I talk about the differences between active and non-active uh, medical students and how much of a difference there is in their in their abilities. You know, I I, I was sometimes criticized in, in grad school. I'd be in the gym training and, you know, everyone else is, is cramming and, and studying for exams. And I was never a really good studier to begin with, but um, I did OK. But, uh, you know, I always found that that uh, that was that was my outlet. That was a great opportunity to maintain at least. And and some a lot of times I would even kick it up a notch, you know, during that uh, during that time frame. So we can look at, you know, gait or movement uh, deficits as an indicator to uh, decline in cognitive abilities. And this, I think this is important because, again, we look at you know, metrics of whether or not what it is that we're doing is, is going to be beneficial, important, or is it, is it working? So we can, we can kind of see, you know, some of these overlaps. And the reason I think this is important because when we look at, you know, our older adult population and what influence, you know, this have, because um, as, you know, some of the most amount of healthcare dollars are actually spent on chronic pain conditions, which causes the reduction in physical activity, increases sedentaryism, increases the amount of money that we spend on healthcare, right? So some of the top things that we spend money on healthcare, especially in the United States, is you know chronic pain and musculoskeletal conditions. And so when we can identify, you know, if someone has a deficit in gait, they can't get up, they can't move around for whatever reason, we do and then, you know, let's translate, okay, well, that's horrible that, you know, basically not moving around is really bad for us and, and causes us to spend a lot of money. Um, look at the other thing of cognition, right? So Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injuries, you know, in a study that just came out and looking at um, not just overt con concussions or overt, you know, brain trauma, but just, you know, chronic rattling that, that, that noggin around and its influence on... Um, cognition, which also we see that reverse effect and the decline on uh, physical activity components. So they are very much linked. There I go again. They are very much linked together in why, you know, we now use motor assessment for neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's, like, you know, Alzheimer's. And right now we spend about $300 billion a year on Alzheimer's and we're we're not going to fix that pharmaceutically anyway because once the the denature and the proteins have occurred you know in the neurons we we can't get them back so our best bet is to you know kind of slow down that uh, slow down that process if we can and early detection is going to be key and actually earlier detection in motor uh, dysfunction is is hugely important and actually it's very similar in traumatic brain injury too right so so we used to just use, you know, a cognitive assessment, you know, the impact testing uh, to look at, you know, the potential effects and, and possible return to play for athletes. But we, we obviously now know that there's a there's a motor component. And in fact, motor will usually go away first and it comes back later than, you know, cognitive ability. So, you know, there's there's an overlap and in those for sure. Uh, balance being directly related to brain health. You know, that's a that's a key component. So, you know, for me, that's a, it's really basic and, and simple. And I'll talk a little bit about dynamic warm up and where we can institute some of these things. But, you know, back in, in, you know, almost 20 years ago, when, you know, we started developing some of these youth strength conditioning programs with a colleague of mine and, and saying, well, 
you know, where do they tend to lack? And it was funny that some of these basic motor skills were absent in, uh, in some of these, you know, high-end athletes, high-end youth athletes, um, because they, they skipped, they went so far forward into their profession, right? If they, they, they played a one sport or even multiple sports, but, you know, it was so focused and demand on competition and, and not so much on, uh, we can then look at, well, where does, um, where does balance fit in even with some of these basic components? Well, that's why I use that board because we can work, you know, the plantar flexion, the dorsiflexion, the, uh, the inversion and the eversion components of balance. And I'll show you again, you know, how we, we address that from a cognitive standpoint too. Um, I really like this one because I've had some personal experience in, in students with, uh, with Asperger's and, and autism. And again, this is, so this is not a specific program, but so this was what I like about, you know, this study is looking at, you know, a, a program to really influence someone who otherwise has some cognitive deficits, especially in, um, in high executive functioning and, uh, and, and, you know, want to kudos out to, uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Peter Gorman, who, you know, I steal a lot of my stuff from too, but, uh, um, in a previous example, previous lecture, you know, I showed one of his patients who with severe autism and, and how, you know, cognitive with motor training had such a dramatic influence on, on her capabilities and, and, uh, just blown away, absolutely blown away. But in any event, so, so this study was looking at the use of this, this mini basketball training, uh, program. The reason I, I, I like this too, is it's, it's making that connection obviously between movement and, and cognition, and it's not in the direction that, you know, you would think that we're supposed to be talking about for this lecture. But again, you know, there, there's a, there's a two way street here. So it's anterior and retrograde with regards to these two things. And I think, you know, what we'll hopefully get down to is, you know, what's the best way to, uh, to address that. But in any event, what I liked about this program is the positive outcome that it, that it had on, um, executive functioning in, in, kids with uh, with Alzheimer's but specifically if you think about it what's different than this than just an exercise program is it's a it's a sport right and uh, and in, in one of my positions I was criticized for trying to work with with athletics because um, you know is that really what the general population does well it, it should be and the difference between between an organized sport is you know, something that's a, a skill in nature. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fitness nut and, and my history is, is in that, but things that require, you know, some sort of processing along with fitness are, are extremely, uh, extremely important. So getting into, you know, brain performance, again influenced by by training and so we look at that from a, a plastic standpoint plasticity meaning that you know when we do stuff even though it's you know the the brain spinal cord it's immersed in this um in this liquefied uh system in cerebral spinal fluid and you know it's if you ever had the wonderful opportunity to play with brains you know they're they're really kind of kind of squishy very much a, a high uh, fluid matrix, but in any event, we create plasticity, you know, these nerve root pathways of, you know, kind of like, I forget there's a, gosh, there was this movie I've seen with the kids many, many times, but you know, they're inside this young girl's head and it's mostly memories and, and things like that, but you know, how those things are, are actually in, ingrained. And so, you know, um, some of this work by, uh, um, Dr. Michael, as I like to call him, because I always butcher his, his last name, but really looking at its influence throughout the lifespan, which is to me awesome. It's kind of like, you know, if you and, and was trained in exercise, we know that there's a lot of overlapping um, capability and physiology. In other words, you know, even someone who's 80 years old, don't give up on them because when they respond to exercise, they respond the same physiology, the same way that a younger person does, maybe not at the same rate, but arguably they could benefit from at least that, if not uh, more so than, than the, than the younger person. And so a lot of earlier studies done in, in rats and, and mice, especially in looking at, you know, the impact from a neurological standpoint and really not even, obviously we, 
we can't uh, we have some difficulty in doing certain cognitive tests with mice and rats um, but when we look at the morphology when we look at the structures themselves you know those things are directly related to you know the physiology and, and how the function and how we can see and look at you know a, a young compared to an old and then compared to an old who was then trained so if you look at you know the neural precision networking over there on the left hand column right next to the rats themselves you look at the old trained actually has a lot of similar brain mapping as that young person does which is pretty awesome you know so it you can't teach an old dog new tricks um, you, you actually can at least teach him the old tricks again because that's that's uh, that's relatively important. Um, a couple of studies. So look up a, a website called brainhq.com. B R A I N E H Q dot com. Um, what I like about them is all their their studies. Um, one, they're fantastic, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit in a minute here. But really, the premise of how do we integrate cognitive training and do we just do stuff you know or is there a better way to go about doing that so they you know really two landmark studies and a lot of this comes from this this basis of what's referred to as the useful field of view which actually started back you know even into the 1970s and what that means is you know as as we're get old getting older you know our useful field of view narrows right we can't take as much distraction as we used to we have less focus and thereby it changes the integration in the brain and really how we're going to respond so the idea was you know can we can we widen that back up and the answer was yes we can and in fact it'll make you better drivers too and so well what else does that have to do with you know things like activities of daily living so two landmark studies the impact study and the active study so both of both of those studies looked at you know integrating these um, these cognitive types of, of training and and what was awesome a whole lot of time now these were not um, sequential or simultaneous with physical activity so this is really just kind of kind of focused on just the cognitive stuff but in any event you know they, they studied you know specific sequences of events and progression right so to be able to progress in a cognitive type of exercise you have to measure what's going on at each one of those levels and we'll talk about and I'll show you something in a second here you know as to well how can we do that and because you want to make sure kind of like in other types of training you know I gave a presentation on on unstable environment training and one of the things that happens you know when you're standing on a BOSU ball and doing squats versus doing squats on a on a solid surface um, if you're doing it for power your power production actually slows down because your your neurological input is some of it's taken away now d does it further enhance your balance and the answer is yes but it's a trade-off right so you're not doing as much force production or power production training in that environment as you are when you're on a stable surface and then again look at the transferability and what types of surfaces you know your athletes going to be training on and so on and so forth and remember that you know if if you break down like I said it's compartmentalized and it's and it's component driven you know sometimes we we do we got to break those things down we can't train everything all all at once because something may may in fact sacrifice so this was focused on on the cognitive training and what i like about this was you know so they did this overall like 18 hours of training 10 18 hours of training um and then they had these boosters so you could do a booster you know after a certain number of months or or years but this is you know looking at what happened after after 10 years now keep in mind that these were older adults to begin with so even at the end of 10 years the capacity in a lot of which they were they were dealing with from from cognitive measures uh maintained right and so that's kind of really unique that you know that type of training has that long last i'm not sure what else we see in that or or what other type of event or intervention that we can do that that actually makes you know that uh that type of, of difference right um kind of not similar study but but an, another study that also looked at the influence of type of training and and throw that out and remember that progressive type of training which is 
that's always been a challenge for us in, in research, you know, because we're changing a variable, right? <laughs> we don't like to change too many variables because that really makes the, the statistical analysis a little bit more challenging and, and especially to look at things like a, like a cause and a, an effect. So they measured, you know, speed, memory, and, and certain types of, of functions, right? Activities of daily living functions, and, in fact. And so, again, the, the beauty is, you know, looking at pre and post interventions were huge. And then certainly the difference between controls. I'm trying not to, to spend a, a whole lot of time on these. But uh, again, follow up in, in similar studies. And if you look at, you know, and, and the reason I'm showing these is because they are dramatically older adults compared to, you know, what some of some people may be considering as as ultimate athletes. But um, even if we didn't care about people as much and we cared about dollars, well, it's going to save us money and maybe we can spend that money someplace else if necessary. But in any event, you know, improving cognition um, improves motor outcomes. And I know, you know, I, I mentioned performance and everyone probably thinks sport performance, but this to me is, is a huge impact on performance because if we can improve gait, if we can improve balance, um, we have a decreased fall risk. And when we have a decreased fall risk, we actually have a decrease in, in falls. And actually when we have a decrease in falls, we further have a decrease in cognitive decline. <laughs> so, you know, there's this circle or, uh, or circle. And so a lot of people are like, well, how does that matter? Why does that even work? So some of it does make a difference in, in how you're performing some of your, your cognitive training, which is why I think, you know, the future for us is really in, um, you know, simultaneous cognitive with, um, with physical activity training, right? Almost like sport, right? Which is, that's what it is. But unfortunately, we don't always have that environment when it comes to when it comes to training. And so we got to figure out other ways that, uh, that we can do that. So in short, it really deals with the visual spatial and the visual um, motor processes that are essentially critical to development, right? To uh, elevating, you know, certain function. And in this case, you know, in, um, in cognition. Right. So here's a and, you know, I don't, I don't want to act like, you know, everything's all all, you know, roses. Because we do have some studies out there that, that don't show it's favorable. In other words, you know, hey, I did this cognitive training along with their exercise training and it didn't make any difference. Here's a problem. <laughs> um, kind of like everything else you, you need to control for some of these things are there better ways of performing physical activity are there better ways of performing cognition and you know do you need to make it progressive you know there's an, another study I, I quote a lot when i'm you know doing this this clinical thing and and you know within uh three sessions of training this one intervention um gained the benefit that it took 10 training interventions, 10 training sessions as another intervention. Um, but at the end, you know, it didn't change. And people are like, oh, I guess it doesn't make a difference. Well, it does, because, you know, you really shorten that. And again, they didn't make it progressive. And so, you know, the difference, the delta and the statistics between the two interventions were insignificant because there wasn't that progression. So, you know, look at this study. And if you look at, I in my opinion and in, in doing what I've done and with my, my cognition training and the stuff that I use is I, I think, you know, some of their stuff was, wasn't very well controlled. It wasn't detailed enough. It wasn't specific really to, you know, some, you gotta, um, you gotta figure out where the deficits are. Right. So this, this is kind of, you know, addressing that and, and really a, a good review study that, you know, does it, does it matter, you know? And, and again, their, their assumption, their discussion is, we speculate that incorporating cognitive tasks into the motor tasks rather than separate training of mental and physical functions is the most promising approach to effectively enhance cognitive reserve, right? And it, it even beyond that because um, we need to manipulate those, right? Because as soon as you get good at something, you know, 
at how long do you maintain it before it's no longer a stimulus and actually you start to go backwards, right? And so that that's kind of important. So even from an exercise standpoint, you know, we've classically seen this in, you know, older studies and exercise without being more progressive. Hence, the reason we even have something called periodization today is that progression is uh, is relatively important. So, you know, this study looks at the dose response, which to me was ding, 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 you know, absolutely fantastic that as things change, you know, if we want to see it as, as if we want to see the intervention, in this case, you know, cognitive stimulation to improve motor performance, there needs to be a change or a progression in that stimulus, the intervention. Otherwise, it may stay flat. And depending on the length of the study, whatever it is that uh, that we got. Um, so, you know, here's here's a subjective performance in, in elite athletes. And, and in fact, all right, I am from New England and, and I am a Tom Brady fan, you know, so when he started doing some of his cognitive stuff and, and how, you know, he he felt personally how how he was performing. But in looking at, you know, adding a, a, a cognitive type of training, it it uh, it needs to be dose response and specific. So in other words, getting better at assessing, well, where are the deficits and, you know, is is everything as progressive in in the in the same way from from one person um, to the next so the answer is we don't think so and so there needs to be a little bit more individuality and again go back to like that the brain hq they have some things on the hawkeye test they have mm, hundreds of thousands of of people you know that have uh have taken this this uh brain speed integration and uh, and and now you know we're able to see you know some of this uh, some of this information. So this this one is on um, this next section is on is on implementation. So here I was going to download in this video, but just for the sake of time, um, maybe I can I can send you a link and put down a link in the in the description or something like that. I have this posted on on YouTube as well, or if you're on my page, just uh, just look for it, motor development. In youth performance conditioning. So this was actually my daughter when she was uh, 2014. So she wasn't three years old yet. And what's interesting, and so I have her running tea drills, I have her running ladders, have her running medicine balls. And yes, I've gotten the criticism that you know my children are not experiments, but um, it's really cool, you know, to see the growth and development from that that firsthand experience over over that long term so in any event you know so she was a late walker so she even start walk she wasn't completely you know unsupportive ambulation until i want to say she was 13 or 14 months um, and during that time we said gosh i wonder you know if she's having any any motor deficit so we actually had a a, a phd therapist come in and, and work with her a little bit and then fast forward in just so this was taken um, about 12 months after she became ambulatory and she's running ladders and she's doing T-drills. She's doing 5-10-5. She's throwing medicine balls. And, and to see you know, changes in the, in the progression and how dramatic those things can do. And along with that, um, we do, yeah, I do a lot of cognitive things, you know, with her. And I believe that that had something to do with with the rapid rate of uh, of her overall progression. So, you know, when we're looking at an approach and and how to add in the components, it's not really different than what we're already doing. But just consider motor learning and the components of motor learning. And and obviously, we're going to be focusing more so on cognitive aspect. And whenever we can combine things, that's awesome because it helps to save us some some time. But the only way you're probably going to know that is to is to do some testing and to figure out you know where someone is and sometimes it's you know doing an intervention having them do something test them in the combined efforts to see if there was a dramatic decrease in their performance right so it's kind of like you know okay you're working with a sprinter and then you want them to add some resistance well i mean if you're decreasing their their you know 20 meter if that's your let's say your training distance by having them wear a weight vest by more than 20 percent you, you might want to reconsider that because you know for if, if the studies have shown that that's actually going to be detrimental to things like technique and and overall performance you know it moves them too slow 
might not uh, might not be a good thing. Understanding things about behavior, I think that's a key aspect. It's it's funny. A lot of my students, you know, now that they're out in the field and and have become you know successful, more and more of them are like, you know, man, it's you're, we're kind of like a psychologist and and from the standpoint of understanding human behavior and things like modification, um, what motivates people, what drives people. And that's, that's important in, in overall, uh, overall performance and acquisition with regards to uh, motor skill. So my son, so my daughter is now eight, my son is almost, almost turning seven. And it's interesting to see the differences in skill acquisition really due to, uh, to motivation. And it's also interesting that, you know, my son is very motivated by, <laughs> by winning and uh and and success in in human movement that uh you know he tends to work at things but it's interesting because then my daughter who um, is not as motivated by that which is completely up to her and I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that um but when she does try she she acquires things you know very very quickly so it comes back to you know really an overall coaching technique and i think that's a big difference in our terminology and, and who we are today and and what it is that we do um and why we're just not you know a personal trainer or you know a fitness instructor but it it can be you know it can be complicated and, and it's not to over complicate that and to think that you know we too much into that so we still need, I, I think, to separate that. It's kind of like, you know, if, if you're already programming and you're doing, you know, a strength phase and then you've got various types of plyometrics and, and things like that, there are things that we can use to enhance, you know, the, the training initially working on performance and success and then changing that up to where we find the deficits. Because even, you know, I put in here being sure to, to change the lead foot is important because, um, they're not in games They're when it's unpredictable, they're not always going to be able to lead with, um, they're not always going to be able to use the same lead foot where they have a particular dominant. So it seems, you know, really, really basic and, and, uh, um, intuitive, but if we don't force people into that, also I consider, you know, earlier about using the, uh, using ladders, you know, using ladders extensively and it's like, well, you know, if you use a really short, you know, step and stride length for, you know, 50 meters, I see people stretch out their agility ladders too. It's like, well, you're beyond, you know, really training where, you know, that part of agility with regards to, you know, movement and running comes from, right? So, so, you know, definitely, uh, definitely reconsider that. So I provide some examples, you know, like a dynamic warm up. you know, can we institute some of these things in there? And some of them very much can be adding an unpredictable name. So using audible versus uh, versus stimulatory. So this is this is specific using you know just the just the balance board because I like to train balance, um, but increasing the cognitive load, right? So this is what I'm referring to when when we say okay, so let's let's see if we can increase the cognitive load. So this is actually you know he's in dorsiflexion. We have him stand on on one leg. And it's find the green square. So only one of the systems is going to light up, and it's only going to light up a green square, right? And so this one actually is a reaction test. There's also something called called a Hawkeye. And then over here on the on the right is essentially the same test. She's in dorsiflexion. I think it was in dorsiflexion. So now instead of a green square, you got to find the red eight. So now there's going to be multiple sensors with different colors with potentially different figures. And so now you don't necessarily just have to figure out which one is being lit up, um, but now you have to actually figure out which one is going to be the red eight. So that's actually an increase in, in cognitive load. And so we can, we can test, um, and that gives me the ability to, to kind of look at, well, you know, when, when do we transition that, that was actually level one and, and level four. So there's two, two levels in, in between that. Um, and then there's an increase in physical load. So this is referred to as the as the Hawkeye test. So this is not speed related. So there's there's this version also on the on the Brain HQ. So it's not speed related. Um, so you're looking for a very specific figure. But what happens is as you improve, and you can see down here when it says test is finished, 178 milliseconds. 
that's the length of time that it's actually flashing up all of the images. You have to find the one that's different. And it's consistent. It's always the same one that's going to be different. But it's progressive, so it automatically changes that. As you become successful, it reduces the time it flashes that. So that's taking you know, how long it's flashing. So that's how long you actually have time to look at it. Your brain makes a decision, decides where it was, and then you go over and, and you swipe that. So this is actually the same test. We're obviously in a different different scenario. So the test is the same. So now there's there's the same cognitive load, but now we've increased the physical load. And so this young man now is going to be on the jumping platform. So consistently jumping, and we can have a metronome. So he has to jump at the beat, and then when he sees and flashes, you know, he uh, he takes a stroke. And then, you know, enhanced more physical, uh, increased physical load is, so now we've got two players and they're going to have to turn around, look, run across and swipe the appropriate, the appropriate sensor. Okay. But now we also have an activity where you need to do it as fast as possible because we have a timer on there, but you got to watch out because you got another person involved in the, in this process. So further increasing also having an influence on making sure that there's some level of, of determination right so it's adding you know changes in in cognitive load and physical load two very strong key components while um, while doing these things simultaneously in a controlled environment so it's always been a challenge to create an unpredictable environment in you know a training capacity especially now we're this aspect of uh, of cognition. So first part summary, and and actually I don't even think I, I made a second part for it, but um, here's what we know. So cognition, it is. It's related to agility and performance. It's very important that there needs to be a component of progression to make it work. So we're not there yet. There's a lot of literature that's kind of lacking, and that was going to be my second part summary. But um, so I'm going to overlap here. We do know that, that deficits in brain function do create deficits in overall motor function, and it has an influence on our overall um, body system. So that is, that is very well known, and that's why, again, we're trying to look at this reverse faction and, and see what we can do. Improvements can occur at any age, right? And it's not detrimental, right? You're not going to overdo it um, in terms of making people improve their cognition too much. That's just not going to happen. Um, but we know that people aren't too old. We can actually benefit from uh, from doing better even as as we get older. In fact, it's it's probably even more worthwhile because of all the other associated you know comorbidities along with um, not having appropriate cognition, which causes a decline in motor and vice versa, and it's just a bad thing. So improving overall health, you know it. Uh, it's, it's good for individuals because of not, not even just the longevity. We're pretty good at keeping people alive, but again, it, it you know, quality more so than ever. Um, but even if you didn't care about people and it was all about healthcare dollars. And so, you know, I'd mentioned earlier, we're looking at, it's, it's going to be about a trillion dollar a year industry looking at Alzheimer's. And the race right now is just, is pharmaceutical. As soon as we identify that there's a problem, you know, taking a pharmaceutical agent, but, um, I won't say exercise is free, <laughs> right? You might might have to buy some equipment or you know whatever, right? You you get the point to where um, you know exercise and cognition training is really you know what are the potential side effects from it, and uh, you know what is the overall overall cost? And like I said earlier, in the in the cost benefit ratio. So the second part of the summary is I didn't really give you any details and you know how do we implement that? I'm gonna kind of leave that up to you for now. Maybe we'll we'll do a follow up and. And I'll show you some some full programming, but you know we're we're lacking in some of the specific literature. You know what is the dose response, and and I know you know everyone wants that. Well, what do I got to do? And you know, we we can't emphatically say that right now. And even you know we we are just inundated with products from from all these different companies as to you know things that lights and flashes and bells and whistles and you know. There is a process and it's not just as simple as, you know, 
find the red light or whatever. Um, but there is a there is a process, and and again, I, I'm not affiliated with Brain HQ, but go to them and and take a look at some of their stuff because um, their processes are evaluated, and so you know their publications are related to this uh, this type of progression. Um, so in the description, you know, I've left my my information. So if you got any questions, give me uh, give me a holler, and we will see you next time.